in the pre-Vedic area, though the word actually comes for the first time in the Rig Vedas, then the Upanishads and the Gita brings it more and more to the forefront. And now the word has become so common, a household term, that the laptop that I just got yesterday as a gift of grace has the word yoga written on it. And the more interesting part was that it is in competition to another laptop which goes by the name of Zen. So yoga has entered a very competitive market. Nevertheless, it is, uh, today we see a whole lot of varieties of yoga. And so we wonder which one to choose, which one to pick up on. But actually for each age, there has been a yoga. There is a, yoga has evolved. As human consciousness has evolved, yoga has evolved. Because yoga is a means to unite with the origin, the ultimate, the absolute, the source, the divine, call it whatever. And it's but natural that as we grow, the ways and means of yoga are bound to grow. It's not something fixed, given at one time for all ages to come. When man is largely conscious in his body, we have the ancient science of hot yoga for him. Because it's the easiest when I am conscious of my body and little else, then the body becomes the means through which I can try to connect with the source. Of course, the hot yoga which was practiced in those days is very different from the way it is practiced now. Like everything else, today's hot yoga is more like McDonald's fast food. It may <laughs> give us a little bit of good health, but we Frankly, it's not proper to use the word yoga with it. It's no more a means for union with the divine, but simply a means to keep ourselves fit, which is a, a very good thing to do. I mean, very good for uh, the general public, not good for the doctors, because it takes the business away. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it's a good thing. But we, we cannot really use the word yoga, because hat yoga as it was practiced, as Shubhindu would tell us, by the old Lemurian kings, for hours and hours, 8 hours, 10 hours, I know of certain hot yogis who, who do this uh, for hours and hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, who are practicing hot yoga. They are literally squeezing the body to make sure that the consciousness trapped within it escapes and finds a way to unite with the divine. So if we are acutely aware of the body and mostly of the body, so in that age of mankind, we have Hatha Yoga. But then mankind, through evolution, becomes conscious not just of the body and the breath, but of something which we may call as the mind, something which, is, which connects with our thoughts, our feelings. We become conscious of that. And as mankind began, became conscious of that, there was another yoga which was given to man, and that is Raj Yoga. It's essentially it starts from the mind, it's taking off, point is quite high, not the body. It comes back to a mastery of the body, but through the mind. It can dispense away with elaborate asanas, etc. Though what we see today as Patanjali system, actually it's not really Patanjali system. He simply codified, he tried to create a synthesis of whatever was happening at that time. And so we see asanas, pranayam entering into Patanjali system but not in the way it is done in Hatha Yoga. It is mainly to make sure that the body is stable enough so that one can sit or be in a particular position for a long time comfortably. And then its take on point is, taking off point is the mind. So the yogin in Raj Yoga starts with the mind and not with the body. And through that he makes the mind more and more refined, subtle, various types of control, mastery, powers hidden within the mind, just as Hatyuki discovers possibilities within the body, Lagima, Garima, Anima, Mahima, ways through which we can really bring out latent things within the body. Similarly, the Rajyogin brings out latent powers within the mind, the ability to influence thoughts, the ability to control thoughts, the ability to receive thoughts, the ability to cast an influence far and wide. 
the ability to exert pressure upon the physical environment by the power of the mind. So all these are hidden possibilities, though you know uh, we are made to believe that we are slaves. We are not really slaves, but uh, by yoga, the Raj Yogin brings out these possibilities. But then, as mankind ascends still further, he becomes aware that he is not just a body and the mind. He is also an inner being. Something which is more subtle, more subjective, more intrinsic, more himself. What we can really call as man as he is himself. So as he goes further, we have another yoga. We see in the yoga of the Gita, new things added up. It's not just in Raj Yoga, Hat Yoga is there, but it's a small little step. In the yoga of the Gita, we have Raj Yoga, but it's a small little step. It, it occupies a small corner, but the rest of the yoga starts with the inner being of man. How his thoughts, his feelings, his will, all these can unite together and uplift themselves to the sublime, to the divine origin. But then mankind has moved still further. Otherwise, there is no evolution. Evolution has carried us to a point where we more and more have become individualized at one point. Uh, and at the same time we feel the sense of a larger unity in which we live. So a new yoga has to be given for earth and man, appropriate to the age in which we live. And that yoga is the yoga of Sri the integral yoga of Sri and the mother. It's a new yoga in the sense that if we see all these processes, Hatha Yoga to Raj Yoga to the Yoga of the Gita, the yoga of the tantra, there are many other, I am not touching upon many many types of sub yoga but the mainstreams of yoga. The possibility of uniting with the divine becomes more complete, at the same time it becomes more and more simpler. The divine does not want us to do very complicated difficult things. So very often we, uh, you know when people read Sri Aurobindo, uh, one thing they say is that Sri Aurobindo is very difficult. I have always found it very strange uh, because actually he is very direct, very simple, very straight. The problem is our minds are not at all direct. Lots of metaphysical theories humming and buzzing inside the mind and we are very complicated people. So when a simple, direct, straight something comes within the mind, it fragments into multiple channels and the mind is active. Why does Shurabindu say that? Why doesn't he say that? He says as he sees it. Savitri is a record of his experiences. There is no why to it. If somebody asks me to describe, describe this all, I will describe just as I see it. Now if somebody tells me why have you made this person sit in front and that person behind, well I have not made it. I am just seeing it and I am describing it. It's not about good or bad or right or wrong, it's just a seeing. And it's wonderful, he sees things from the eye of truth and he gives it to us just as it is. But our minds want something which we should do. There comes a big difficulty because another challenge with Sri Aurobindo is everybody asks all this is very fine, but tell us what I should do. You know, we live in an age when we are the doers, uh, we are great people, we, we must do something. And we read pages after pages and pages after pages. And while there are many hints and suggestions, there is nothing as concrete as thou must do this. Nowhere. Nowhere we see that kind of a, this is the practice you must follow every day morning, get up at 4 o'clock and practice meditation with this mantra for 2 hours. Nowhere. Or follow this prescription and that prescription and no other. Nowhere. There are many hints and guidances and suggestions. And what is the reason? Simply because he wants, or rather he is telling us that look, my child, you have done yoga since time immemorial. Let me now do the yoga for you. You sit quietly and let the yoga be done in you. And the original sense of yoga, particularly when we turn to the Gita, we see it is the divine who does the yoga. This is the first fundamental difference. It's not, I will do a yoga, I will have an experience, I will have nirvana. That is an old type of approach. I am the doer, I am having wonderful experiences, and I am the one who is seeking my own moksha or mukti or some kind of a you know dwelling place, ticket to heaven, uh, maybe at the cheapest possible rate. 
but that's not what yoga is about yoga is done by the divine and through this power of yoga he is lifting everything up towards him through a progressive transformation so what does man do does he do nothing well what man can do is man can collaborate that's what the mother said he can collaborate so the practices of yoga begin to change it's no more that i will do this method but what i can do to open myself to the divine working for instance one of the practices in yoga is to quiet in oneself so why quiet in oneself well the example is very simple in uh, most households at least you know in indian household it's a familiar sight mother is cooking some nice meal and the child is busy playing outside and if the child comes into the kitchen and wants to cook mother says no 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 you you take your bath wash your hands and feet and then come i am preparing some dish for you so if we start meddling it becomes a problem so we are taught to quiet in the mind now how do we start meddling in the yoga of the divine we begin to raise all kinds of issues doubts questions uh, analysis our mind is full of all kinds of thoughts uh, systems theories philosophies notions and all this interferes with the simple direct luminous action direct action of the divine in us so when we quiet in the mind the action becomes more and more powerful it's as simple as that any method any technique is good enough one of the simplest ways to quiet in the mind is of course savitri read a few lines as uh, as we were saying it's beyond time and space <laughs> it blows the lid and quietens us so quiet in the mind then there is quieting of the vital again if the vital is too active restless how how will god's power work within us you know there is a small little story that a man was uh, suddenly surrounded by a bunch of goons so he didn't know what to do so he called lord shiva 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 so now the scene shifts and shiva gets ready with his you know trident to help his devotee so his shakti parvati mother she asked where are you going my devotee is in distress and as he steps out he returns back and sits back into meditation and she says what happened now he says no he has lifted up his own lathi and he wants to fight it out himself so you know he doesn't trust me enough he says god knows when will shiva come my stick is good enough to chase these goons now you know this quietening of the vital is so that we allow the divine power the divine grace to work within us most of the practices surrender equanimity if we really see their essence basically they are ways through which we can collaborate we be a very interesting indian term for it there is yoga which the divine does and we have to do sah yoga and it's conjured in a beautiful story of nara and narayana the two ancient yogis where they come together and fight out in this world the divine does and the nar the human portion has to become an instrument he has to become receptive open quiet surrender and then the yoga proceeds in him so this is one of the uh, one of the newness that shurabindu actually brings the ancient truth of yoga into the forefront and that is the reason when we read through shurabindu we see things like open to the mother now you know people get very lost what does it mean open to the mother you know when young people go to ashram and all of us had the same experience at least i had one when i you know reading through synthesis i asked a very old sadhak i said so shurabindu emphasizes a lot upon the will isn't it by your own will power he said no 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 shurabindu speaks of surrender now you know <laughs> in in uh, even now this is uh, you know if you go and ask most old sadhaks uh, in the ashram how do you do this yoga they will say take mother's name so you know most young people are very dissatisfied because what is this take mother's name there must be something i must do uh, then they start asking in direct question okay tell me what time how much you meditate so he says no 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 i i go regularly for my work morning this time to this time when someone asked shurabindu uh, 
uh, I want to come to ashram to get a mantra from the mother. Sri said in his characteristic unconventional way, the mother does not give mantra, she gives work. So, you know, again people don't understand what is this by doing work in one of the ashram departments. How do you do yoga? You must be having a practice. And then sometimes they begin to feel there must be some secret practice because they are not telling us. Now this is the secret practice and that practice is to open to the mother. Just to open in whatever way, calling her name, looking at her picture, by reading something she has said, by reading Shurabindo, by simply remembering her in the heart. It's <coughs> as simple as that. So if we really look at the whole evolution of yoga and Shurabindo's own yoga in that whole context and with the background, basically the divine wants to make the yoga more and more easy for us. So one thing we must get rid of from our minds is that it's very difficult. The yoga is very difficult only in its aim, but the yoga is very easy when we look at the method. These are the two different things. It's difficult in the aim because Shurabindo speaks of mankind reaching a crucial stage where not only the soul, but even our nature can engage in yoga. This is, you know, taking that example of, uh, you know, Narad, that we have the instrument and we have somebody who plays the instrument. So imagine a master singer who has, uh, or let's say master musician, who has learned the best possible music, the highest possible music, uh, maybe celestial musician, but if you give him a block of wood and say, take out the music, he'll say, yes, I can, but I'm limited by the instrument. So yoga up till now has been for the soul. That's why it has become an individual yoga. The individual engages, his own soul ultimately arrives at a state of beatific nirvana and that's the end of the story. But nature, which is universal, remains as it is. But mankind has evolved. It's nature, our nature can engage in yoga. And it's a big thing because if nature engages in yoga, it's universal. Souls are individual, but they can enter into a state of universality. But nature, every movement of nature is universal. Though we live in this illusion of an ego identity that, you know, this is me. But actually, if you really take a hard look, we'll say that everything is found in everyone else. There's a very nice little couplet by famous mystic Kabir, uh, Saint. He says, you know, I started to see evil in the world. And he puts it first, I'll... You know, the original flavor of Hindi, Bura jo dekhan mein chala, mujh se bura na koi. So he says that, you know, I, I went to see where is evil. And I ended up ultimately pointing a finger at myself. There is none, nobody as bad as myself in this world. So it's basically, it's pointing to a deep truth of oneness of nature. And all the forces of nature are there in every human being. But it means that if one person can touch something in his nature and change it, it will have repercussion on everybody else. So this is the plus side of it. There is the negative side we all know that, well, man is known by the company he keeps and, you know, we get into a certain company, we get influence, there is an interchange, all this is one part of it. But the other part is that if I can change one element in my nature, then it has repercussions on everyone else and that's how this yoga becomes a collective yoga. Collective yoga is not by the gathering of number of people. It's not that if there are one lakh people then we are doing more collective yoga than if there are a thousand people. One single person can engage in collective yoga without a second person by his side. If he works upon his nature because nature is universal. And if each of us can sincerely engage with ourselves in the transformation of whatever little um, package, bundle of nature given to us, it will help with everybody's evolution. So this is the task that this yoga engages in. So this is another new element of this yoga. Now, the third aspect of this yoga is, as we said, that, you know, normally we think, we have been, you know, we are very anthropocentric, so we think about man. Man is the beginning and man is the end. Man does yoga, man gets nirvana and then it comes to me, not even others. But yoga is taking place in the earth. All evolution is the result of a secret pressure of consciousness 
from within to emerge and new forms emerge new possibilities emerge new things happen and if i were to recount the whole history i'm sure many of us know it's amazing the roots that evolution takes many people who read shirvindo and the mother and they talk about new creation and they begin to wonder oh but where is the new creation where is the new man and i would suggest let's read the history of evolution of man himself one lakh years according to you know whatever data we have today when the first man emerged he was so much like the beast he was not even standing erect and there were nine abortive species some of them were very prominent it looked like they were the final ones the closest ones being neanderthal and the crow magnon man they fought with each other they they fought the destroyer but ultimately out of all this today what we have homo sapiens erectus has emerged out of that process so we have just started on a new venture of a new man it may take maybe 1000 years 2000 years what does it matter it's a wonderful project to be engaged in and that's what you know shubhendra speaks of the transformation and the emergence of a new species or a new race or a new humanity or what the term which i prefer most is a divinized humanity because then you know it takes care of all the other superlatives because otherwise there is a tendency to feel that you know it's an elite club it's not an elite club it's in fact the elites are the most difficult people i'm not talking of elite in the true sense but there is a kind of feeling that i am an elite and it's very difficult for them to engage into yoga because they are so self satisfied with themselves no wonder christ said it is the meek and the weak who shall inherit the earth and so true because the meek and the weak feels the need of the divine those who feel that well i have everything they are maddened in their own pride and they don't feel they need anyone else and the result is whatever we see today so yoga is taking place in earth it's an evolutionary journey but the difference is that man can consciously collaborate if man doesn't collaborate well yoga will continue evolution will continue new beings will emerge until a divinized form appears and manifests on earth so we must know that there is an important role that man has to play but we must also remember that our importance is of relative importance it's not an absolute importance the creation the the work of god does not depend only upon us it's an undertaking taken by the divine if man doesn't collaborate he moves out of the way dolphins evolve along the sea they are very close cousins just as if you know that's a backup plan of god <laughs> if man doesn't they are ready very fast there is lot of space no issues about traffic jams no fuel crisis and they can evolve into very conscious beings absolutely divinized being what prevents so we should not you know believe that creation depends upon earth earth depends upon us and you know even sometimes we believe god depends upon us no <laughs> he has his own ways but it will be wonderful if we can become conscious collaborators why not why should we go through all this kind of mass destruction which happens every time humanity reaches a point and then collapses the mother speaks about it that you know six times there have been massive deluges and mass destructions upon earth and this is the seventh creation once again mankind is striving trying to evolve go beyond itself and it will be a pity if mankind crashes back and has to start all over again because it's not at all a good state so let us uh, make our choices and consciously collaborate and participate and that's where we see the beginning of savitri savitri in fact begins from one such cycle of creation now we may say it's the beginning of creation or we may say one such cycle of creation and it looks like it's one such cycle of creation because shubhendra describes that creation has plunged into darkness but there is in the darkness something like a faint remembrance which is stirring inside there is no nothing called as absolute darkness there is something inside like a remembrance like a cell which has forgotten itself and it begins to stir and move and emerge and come out and evolve and eventually it receives the touch of the divine that's the 
beautiful journey. We shall read in detail tomorrow what this journey is about. It starts from that. It's a wonderful story. It starts from my own story. Very often when people write autobiography. So they write from, well, I was born on so and so date in so and so place. That's not a biography or autobiography. It's silly. We should be able to say, I'm millions of years old. Mother said this when she was asked, said, my child, I'm millions of years old. And then she adds after a pause, and I'm waiting. We should be able to say that. Maulana Rumi, the greatest, great Sufi mystic, he was told, aren't you afraid of death? He said, why should I be afraid of dying? When I died as a stone, I was born a plant. When I died a plant, I was born a tree. When I died a tree, I was born a bird and a beast. When I died a bird and a beast, I was born a man. Why should I be afraid of dying? Yes, we have to forego the humanness for the divinity to emerge. But this foregoing is not in the sense of annulling. This is the other message of Savitri. Yoga is not divorced from life. It's not an annulment of the human, but an upliftment and an ultimately, eventually a transformation of the human into its divine equivalent. So we lead our life as it were on two planes. One is very, very human, earthly, and we are, you know, we speak of our life as I am born, so and so place, and then all our life, we are trying to defend it. Somebody has very beautifully said, you know, this, um, that, you know, when we are born, uh, someone gives us a name, somebody gives a surname, and somebody gives us a religion, another person gives us a holy book, and all our life we are trying to defend it. But we didn't choose for it. <laughs> What's my choice? So, you know, as we grow, as we evolve, we must discover what is that original religion, if I may say so. It's not even humanity. Our original religion is that we are all divine by the very fact that we have emerged from it, we are divine. You know, there is a tradition in India that when we, somebody takes to yoga, so he's given a new name. It's very interesting. So before the name, often they will use the word Swami, but that's not important. It's about that we have to become master of ourselves. But the surname is dropped, a name is given, and after the name, there is a common surname which is added. What is the surname? Ananda, Vivekananda, Nikhilananda, Ranganath Ananda, plenty of Anandas. That's our real surname. That's our identity. We are children of bliss, children of immortality, and we are begging for scrapnels of joy and pleasure and happiness from here and there. So what is yoga? It's about recovering my own true identity in a, in a certain sense, who I really am. So my life story doesn't start with this human form. My life doesn't even start with my humanity. It doesn't even start with stone. It goes still further. Where does my life begin? Well, it begins from that. It's very beautiful. You see this very uh, first uh, page of Savitri. So very often, well, it's about my life. All life emerges. And if we see the symbol even in human life, where does it emerge from? From a womb of darkness. What is there in the womb of darkness? A conception which is dual. You see, when, even at a human level, because the same truth symbolically represents itself. Parents don't only conceive a biological child. Ask any parent and they will say, well, the child is also a conception of their idea of what a child or human being should be. Now, this idea may be very vast, the idea may be very small and narrow, but all conception is a dual conception. It is material and it is ideative. Are a dual conception. We are a body and we are also a divine idea, the real idea, something which the divine wants us to be. And that real idea, that divine idea is there within us as the original blueprint, the seed, the original script of the divine. And what is that real idea which is there in all of us is the super mind. It is the real idea, original truth what we should be and what we should manifest. So why doesn't it manifest easily? Because the script gets 
very often you know olden times there used to be court philosophers so they were very very talented people very erudite but what was their task their task was to write very nice poetry which would please the king so all their talent all their intelligence all their capacity is being diverted into pleasing the king and therefore the poetry becomes something small similarly with our own life there is a divine script within us the real idea but it gets unfortunately channeled wrongly diverted wrongly by the ego into pleasing ourselves or pleasing those who would satisfy my ego see there are very beautiful simple practices which the mother gave one of them being we are not here to please ourselves we are not here to please others we are here to please the divine what does it matter what opinion i have about myself what does it matter what opinion others have of myself what does it matter what opinion i have of others it is irrelevant what matters is what the divine thinks of me i am not using the word judges because he does not judge he is himself playing with himself he does not judge he sees he knows he loves he acts this beautiful line in savitri when death tells savitri that you know if you know then you would cease to love what are you doing and she says i see i love i act and when i have loved all then i shall know it's in you know when we discovered that secret oneness so this is the story of us where does it just as we start from the womb of darkness in which we have no identity similarly we start from this womb of darkness we have these lines book 1 canto 1 the symbol dawn it was the hour before the gods awake across the path of the divine event you see this symbol applies at so many levels it was the hour before the gods awake who are the gods they are powers of the divine what do they do every function from the thought of the mind to senses to feelings everything is eventually traced back to a god or a power or an aspect of the divine who motivates them to function it's very interesting you know and we can we can understand it in a very simple way actually i had this revelation thanks to the uh, lovely journey in the car and i didn't share it in the car but i can share it now there's some very nice cute little uh, dolls in the car you know <laughs> some puppy some and uh, as i was uh, holding these dolls and all of us actually and then i was putting inside and we all must have experienced it don't we feel it is become real and it's like you know extension it cannot speak it doesn't do anything but something of my consciousness animates it we may not realize it but it's a real relation which we form it's our consciousness which makes the doll come true come alive you know people as children know this very well that's how you know they form attachment but when we grow up we are told this is inanimate that is animate it's not true there is nothing non living in creation we can form a living relation with everything so similarly there is there is this one consciousness which informs all things beholds all things and by its beholding all things it animates it makes it come alive makes it grow very nice line in savitri beholds the icon growing by its gaze icon it's a symbol it looks and as it looks it pours and it makes it come alive and grow and then it forms a relation with it so you know it it's it got survey now that's before any faculty is woken up before any function has woken up and also we can say it's the first stir of creation neither there are the gods nor are there the titans so this story applies at many levels individually we experience the same event every time in our life that we are born from the womb of darkness and before the gods are awake nothing is functioning just the heart is beating at one point of time even heart is not beating and slowly the gods begin to awake it's also the story of the origin of creation 
in india it's uh, you know immortalized through a tradition that every day morning sometime between uh, 2:30 or 3 o'clock till sunrise it's a period called as brahma muhurt the stillness the gods are sleeping so who is awake when the gods are sleeping the yogin is awake when the gods are sleeping why because he alone can go beyond the gods even the gods i have not yet started their rounds but the yogin is awake it's a very beautiful symbol but that apart so see how many levels this symbol works across the path of the divine event how much has been written about this divine event at the most outer level it's the event that is going to take place on this day when satyavan will die and savitri will bring him back to life it's a divine event why because death is an everyday event but immortality is not an everyday event it needs a divine intervention at another level deeper level vaster level it's a divine the divine event is creation itself look at how beautiful shobindo you know makes it we are taught that to do yoga you must shun creation you should stop loving creation because god is other than this creation this is world that is god but if creation itself is a divine event why should i seek mukti or individual nirvana i would rather love to work for him serve him he is here in this piece of mud he is there he is there in the human heart he is there who flies in the bird he is there you know beautiful that poem of shobindo who who that poem in the blue of the sky in the green of the ether whose is the hand that has painted the glow when the wind winds were asleep in the womb of the ether who was it raised them and bade them to blow so he is there in every element of creation creation is a divine event which we, we need to realize it we need to recognize it by running away from creation we cut off one whole side of divine working and while we may get individual nirvana and be happy with it at another level we may say maybe in the divine size that oh thou selfish one you too were seeking only nirvana there is something more than that so creation is a divine event yoga is going on in creation the huge foreboding mind of night alone in an unlit temple of eternity there is a state of darkness utter darkness just as when we are in the womb it is an unlit but look at the next phrase temple of eternity what is creation it is the temple of eternity what we have to do light it up and where is the light in our own heart the psychic being is the light the lamp that must light up this temple of temples which is creation my own body is a temple and it must be lit up with the psychic being so but it, it starts from this phase when it's unlit lay stressed immobile upon silence march almost one felt opaque impenetrable in the somber symbol of a rayless muse the abyss of the unbodied infinite if fathom less zero occupied the world this the state when we don't even know what is there is it there is it not there you see all conception also starts with that i am giving this human symbol it's not that savitri is about the birth of a baby but it's very easy to understand because the same truth repeats itself the first step is is it there is it not there we don't know we have to wait for a time when the child declares itself that i am there so there is at first a state when there is something but there is nothing overt nothing which is obvious so it's a fathomless zero and yet something is there within it a power of fallen boundless self awake between the first and the last nothingness recalling the tenebrous womb from which it came turned from the insoluble mystery of birth and the tardy process of mortality and long to reach its end in vacant not something stirs something comes out 
but wants to go back. Creation has a tendency to collapse back. You know, nowadays, uh, you know, all kinds of variations of yoga. So one of them is go with the flow, back to nature. Now, you know, this is a very nice way to get back to that fallen self. Because, you know, creation has this tendency. There is a strong gravitation which pulls us down. There is nothing, you know, when people say yoga is difficult, well, of course, but are we here to do easy things? The easiest thing is to, you know, be overpowered by all the forces of nature. Lust and anger and greed and all the rest. Well, that's one way to look at it. Because it has a natural tendency. So long to go back into the vacant knot. But, and there is a but, thankfully, as in the dark beginning of all things. So we should not be afraid of darkness, sometimes in our personal life, sometimes in the life of creation, sometimes in the life of a nation or a collectivity, we experience darkness. Shobindu would tell us in Savitri, darkness is a magic of self-hidden light. There is a reason, he has hidden himself. There is a reason why darkness has come. Why? Because many old things must break and something new must emerge. Let me read that also. It's very beautiful. What really darkness is? We are so afraid. Shubhindu says it's the beginning. So here it is on page 231. So, one of the things that we see unique about Sri Aurobindo's Yoga, why he could reveal all these things to us? Because not only did he go into the highest regions of light, we have heard about yogis living in the light or you know, experiencing light, experiencing vastness, all that is old stuff. Yes, someone had to also enter into the darkness and see what is lying there. Someone had to go there and wake up that power which was hidden inside the darkness. What is that power? It is the same original power. That supramental, which is self-revealed above, it is involved in creation. Mother Shivinda used the word involved supermind. But someone had to go there and wake it up. Come, your hour has come. Even now, it is throughout the history, it is supermind that has acted. It's the original power of creation, the original wisdom. But always through many, many layers and veils, never its direct action. Mostly through the overmind gods and every time these veils deflect its action, distort its action, it's like too many middlemen. And so creation has become what it is. But it was necessary. Now the time has come for all the middlemen to be removed away. So that we can directly have our own experience of the divine, not just in our souls, but even in our bodies. So, he goes into the darkness, Shurvindu. There are many unique things about Shurvindu Yoga, which as we go through the days, we will discover one of them is this. So, what does he discover there? He is sharing his discovery with us. He saw in night the eternal's shadowy veil. This one life is enough, line is enough to liberate us. Don't we experience darkness sometime or the other? Imagine that when we experience darkness, we remember this line and we say, Oh, you are hiding behind this darkness? Life will change. I can assure you life will change. When we look inside and say that it's not just the darkness, Behind the darkness is the smile of the beloved. Life will be very different. So he's sharing our discovery, his discovery with us. He's telling us not to be afraid of darkness. People are too much afraid, so they run away from earth, run away from creation and give it the sanctified, hallowed name of yoga. Earth is Maya, world is Maya, God is truth. Let us run away. But Sri says, wait. Perhaps you have not looked enough. 
if you look deeply you will see earth is not maya she is a goddess she is bearing all this load of creation because she must give birth to a divine possibility so we will love her he saw in night the eternal's shadowy veil new death for a seller of the house of life what is death it's a transition why are we afraid of transitions haven't we had several transitions the first transition when we are born big transition <laughs> it's a bigger transition because you know as the mystics know there is life beyond death and suddenly it cramps down to a small little fragile limbs it's a transition that's why perhaps the child cries what has happened to me then we transit from infancy to childhood childhood to adolescence adolescence to adulthood all these transitions are difficult transitions painful transitions adulthood to middle age very difficult transition adulthood you are in control of everything middle age you must know that you are not really in control of everything you must understand you are entering your uh, now another zone in ancient india there used to be this you know now is the time for one prast meditate upon the divine and let the youth come forward then you transit from middle age to you no know, old age is time when we reevaluate all our life then we transit into what is known as old age it's another season another mood of life and then we make yet another transition through the door of death into another kind of life mother says you know human beings have this strange tendency of separating the living from the dead she says they mingle together but human beings don't understand they live in frightful ignorance so they say this belongs to the living that is the dead as if they don't exist so he says new death as a seller for the house of life life alone is in destruction felt creations hasty pace you know we we are often appalled and we see the sight of destruction in india we are taught this through a very simple story and that's the story of mahabharata so mahabharata saw the destruction at a catastrophic you know scale large scale beyond all the kshatriya that destroyed same with humors you know all the warring races <coughs> adults men they are all destroyed and yet shri aurobindo says that through mahabharata shri krishna saved india and saved the world how did he do it for that we have to get rid of the sense of the immediate and look behind and look beyond what is happening in our immediate uh, environment there is something deeper that deeper wisdom we must get he will reveal us in savitri in the secret knowledge so new in destruction felt creations hasty pace that's why uh, you know we have kali kali is tremendous destruction but she changes things kala time she is the lord of time with one foot she changes all time and in creation it is felt as destruction its creation's hasty pace new loss as the prize of a celestial game that's the law of yoga law of all evolution loss as the prize of celestial gain once again i am reminded of a small couplet someone was asked what is love and the mystic says you know the stream of love flows in an opposite way so what is the opposite way he says those who swim into this stream lose those who drown into it they get across so the smart ones are the loser ones those who believe ah i am the smart one i have fooled everybody doesn't know at what price whereas there is another truth which we often do not see new loss as the prize of a celestial gain to lose what to lose the ego for what for the divine very much worth it to lose littleness for what for true greatness not what men applaud as greatness to lose our smallness our pettiness our lower nature for the sake of what 
for a higher supernature that waits for us on the peaks. Why should we lose it? So that we create space, you know, and something comes into the house. Again, every year on the Deepavali day, the, I don't know now people follow it or not, Deepavali is the festival of lights. It's the darkest night and there is a tradition associated with Deepavali. People burn the lamps that everybody knows and its distortion is those bursting of crackers which is purely nothing to do with Deepavali. <laughs> it has to do with the firecracker industry. But there is a third tradition which I do not know if somebody may remember that there is an emptying of the place of all the clutter. Sometimes it's done symbolically, but sometimes done physically. People actually take out things which they don't need and they give it away. It's a very interesting tradition. You are invoking light, create space for it. So we need to create space, loss. Without that, we can't, you know, there's no space. The divine will come and want to enter in, into our house. And imagine we'll say, uh, yeah, just please wait for some time. Uh, you know, I'm looking after my uncle and maternal uncle and my father-in-law and my daughter-in-law and everybody uh, in laws. So divine becomes an outlaw. But, you know, <laughs> it should be the other way around. He's the lord of lords. He comes and everything should be quiet and still. Waiting for him. Everybody should be waiting for him. He's the real guest of honor. But very often, he is not the guest of honor. He is just given a lip service. When we give lip service to the divine, but the real Lord is the ego, then it is called religion. You know? <laughs> we seat him into a mandir or a church or a mosque or whatever else. <laughs> and we give lip service. But all else is about the ego. About the dress, about, you know, this or that, full of hate, sometimes... Uh, jealousies and all kinds of things. But to remove the ego and seat the divine in its place, Shurindo at one place defines yoga in this way. In place of the ego, to seat the divine consciousness is yoga. How simple. How easy. That's all we have to do. Nothing much. No kriyas, no practices. Whenever ego comes, give it a good blow and say, you fool, <laughs> you have cheated me so far. I don't want you. <laughs> you have no place. <laughs> Shut the door. <laughs> I have somebody else whom I want in my heart. It's the Divine Mother. I need to love her. So, yoga will, you know. New loss as the prize of a celestial gain. It's a, it's a gain. As the Ish Upanishad says, Tena Tyaktena Bhunjita. By renouncing, enjoy. What a powerful statement. Renunciation is not something we cowardly, oh, I can't enjoy it like, you know, many people pass their midlife, become vegetarians because the tooth are falling and, you know, they cannot chew <laughs> non <-vegetarian. laughs> Or because of fear of malignancy and heart problems. This is not renunciation. <laughs> Old man's renunciation, senses are failing. <laughs> renunciation is very powerful. Why? Because you are preparing yourself to receive delight. You are letting go of small pleasures because something else is awaiting for you. And if your system is not ready, it will break down. It's the delight that is at the back of everything. Little joy can turn us crazy. Imagine the delight. So loss is a prize of celestial gain. See, every line is a sutra for yoga. And then finally, and hell as a shortcut to heaven's gates. This, I must say, Every time we experience, and the last experience was yesterday, when in Heathrow they told me, your flight is cancelled. So, bad news. The good news was it is rerouted through DC. And I immediately thought, oh, sorry. I said, wow, I have good company. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I tried calling you, but uh, the phone couldn't go through, so I called up. So, you know, it's all right. Everything is a journey. It's part of the journey. So the lady was very apologetic, uh, saying, you know, I'm, we are really sorry and, you know, uh, we are sorry about all the trouble and problem. I said, no problem at all. I mean, I was really feeling that everything is, uh, you know, the joy of the Divine Mother. So it's, it's uh, hell. Sometimes we, we make life hell not because it is so much hell, but by our thinking. Oh, it's so bad, it's so bad, it's so bad. Perhaps it's not as bad as we are thinking it to be. It, it's bad, it's not that things are not bad. But, but if we understand that it's a passage, hell is a passage. Passage towards 
a greater light. Just as darkness is a passage, death is a passage and finally humanity is a passage. This is one of the biggest messages of Sri Humanity is a passage, transition towards the superhumanity of the future. Three things with which I would end, um, though I don't know, I thought uh, I wouldn't speak much but uh, I just don't feel like stopping. But just three things. You see how Sri wanted to make the yoga more and more simple. He could see that man by his own efforts cannot really engage with yoga. There is a whole history, mankind trying and he says it so beautifully. He says there is one Buddha, one Christ, one Krishna and there are many followers. But how many have risen to really that stature of being another Buddha, another Krishna, another Christ? We can follow and we can be good followers and it helps us. But there is something fundamentally, inherently defective within us that even when we know what is true, we are not able to walk the way. So very often people say that Sri is difficult to understand. No, it's, that's not the difficulty. The difficulty is with our will. All our education from childhood till graduation and super graduation or whatever else, Everything is based upon knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Now I am not speaking about whether it's knowledge or not knowledge. But nobody teaches us a simple thing like how to grow in my will, how to grow in my emotions, how to make my will strong. We are impoverished, we are deficient. And he knew that this is a problem with man. It's not that, you know, he doesn't know what is to be done and what is not to be done. He knows it very well. He takes a good resolution in the morning and breaks it by the evening. There was once a joke in the ashram. One sadhak used to say, oh, stopping cigarettes. Somebody asked him, you know, I am suffering from this habit of cigarette smoking. So he said, oh, stopping cigarettes is very easy. Very easy, very simple. He said, oh, what do you mean? He said, ah, I do it every day. I stop it at night. <laughs> so, <laughs> I do it every day. It's very easy to stop cigarette smoking. Now, you know, this is our predicament. So he wanted to make it easy. Now, how to make it easy? Some power which could do it in man and make, make the yoga accelerate it. Right now, yoga is going on, but at a very slow pace because it's still the mind, the body, the breath, the life energy engaging with yoga. But if some other power can come and take over the charge of the yoga going on in earth, then it could move at a bullet train speed and that power is the original power, the supramental. It has the blueprint, it has the knowledge, it has the power and therefore if it gets directly engaged with earth and humanity, it can lead us fast forward. But that means power is there but we need the tracks, we need the rails, we need the train compartment. So our body has to become capable of bearing the pressure of the bullet train, earth nature has to have steady rails, you know, it's not enough to conceive that there should be bullet train. We need all these equipment. So Shobindu's yoga is directed towards this paraphernalia must become fit and strong. You know, in ashram, there's so much emphasis given on physical education. People often wonder. They come, they are looking for, you know, meditation and meditation hall. And by chance sometimes or by design or destiny, they end up in the playground. And then they are lost with all the equipments, gym and all these things and they wonder <laughs> where is the meditation hall? Because meditation, that's one process, it's okay. It has its place. But the real thing is that now we have to build our nature strong enough and ready to receive the impulsion of God. And Swami Vivekananda had foreseen it. That's why he said, you know, give the youth, teach them to play football, make them, let them have nerves of steel. It will do them more good than reading the Gita because it's there in the blood. But what is not there in us is the capacity to hold, receptive Adhar. So the supramental, this is the first thing he wanted to make it easy. Then he realized man will not even make himself ready. He is he was so lazy. So he made it still easier and that is the Divine Mother. She will do it for you. So what do I have to do? Mother would say, my child, give yourself to me, allow me to work in you, open yourself to me, I'll do the yoga for you. Mother, you'll do everything? Yes, my child, everything. 
What do you expect from us? Nothing. These are her words. You really mean you expect nothing from us? How do you see us? I can't say about this because I expect nothing. I'll do the yoga for you. Makes it so easy. Now where can we find the yoga easier than this? But he also knew man is so hard tied, hard wired by his ego that he won't even go and surrender and open. So Shirobindo, what to do? You know, all the time he is like, like Buddha, concerned with human problems. So he is concerned with us. I can bring down the supramental, man is not ready. Divine Mother will do the yoga for him, but he will not open himself. So what to do? So the third thing which he did to make it simple for us is to gift us Savitri. So it's the age of technology and information, he will at least read the book. And by reading the book, at first he will think he is reading the book. Then the book begins to read him, influence him, come over him. And the book becomes a medium, an instrument to take him into contact with the consciousness of Savitri. And who is Savitri? But the Divine Mother herself. Hasn't he said that it's not just an allegory? allegory. It is they are living beings. They have conscious emanations and we can come in contact with them. And one means to come in contact is Savitri. So basically he made it very very simple. The whole yoga, practice of yoga, not as instruction, not as do it yourself, but simply read it. Read it and you will begin to open to the consciousness of the Divine Mother. Of course, there is a difference because when we directly surrender to the Divine Mother, there is the joy of surrender, joy of aspiration. But when we do it through the book, it comes later. There will come a time when we will ultimately give ourselves. But nevertheless, just reading this book, we think, oh, it's after all just a book. But slowly when we read it, when we plunge into it, then slowly it's like, you know, a wine that hits us after some time. And we are dragged deep and we begin to drown into its depths. In fact, if we understand Savitri, I am using now something from the Ishupanishad, Avigyatam Vijanata, he who has the thought of it knows it not. If we understand Savitri, then we do not understand Savitri. If we enjoy Savitri, if we drown in its delight, if it's difficult to stop Savitri, then we are really understanding a little of Savitri. So let us close with some lines which reveal to us what really Savitri is. And as I said, everything is there in Savitri itself. You see, it's very interesting that the gift of Savitri should be the gifts to man the final corrections version considerably revised particularly after the world war the darkness he had entered deep into it and there was a truth hiding there he brings it out and it's like the, the original script of creation and gives it to earth and man so we have these lines which at least I have always felt that they reveal the truth of Savitri. Yes, I will tell the page. <clears throat> First page 231, four lines. Soon after, shortcut to heaven's gates. Last seven or eight lines from below. Then, in illusions, occult factory. And in the inconscience, magic printing house. Stone where the formats of the primal night and shattered the stereotypes of ignorance. These lines are very wonderful. Illusions occult factory. What really is illusion? We hear about it so often. What is illusion? Illusion is to believe I am limited. It starts from there. It starts from my belief about who I am. This is the first illusion. I am weak. I am incapable. 
I am pointless. I am helpless. It starts from there. Belief in ignorance is one of the first things which, you know, takes us into it. And in the inconscience magic printing house, way back then, Shivindu knew that the printing houses are instruments of inconscient and ignorance. Of course, times are changing and hopefully they will become instruments of light and truth. Uh, when in the ashram context, somebody wanted to read the newspaper uh, and ask for the newspaper, Mother said, okay, you can bring it, but keep it in a particular room and she named the room, room of falsehood. So, you know, <laughs> then and there she knew what, what the media is going to be and see here symbolically, inconscience magic printing house. It has this capacity to make the false seem true and to sway public opinion. Tone were the formats of the primal night and shattered the stereotypes of ignorance. <coughs> and then something new happens. Next page, page 232. Falsehood gave back to truth her tortured shape. What is falsehood? It is twisting truth. That's why very often it is said that scripture is the weapon of the devil. Devils quote scriptures and they quote it to twist the mind. They quote, quote it but just give it just a little twist. The God becomes my God. My God becomes my exclusive God. My exclusive God becomes none of your God. My alone. So you see it starts from how it twists. It's a little twist given. And then it becomes first a religion, a cult, a sect, and eventually fanaticism, you know, it, a problem with which we are all grappling today. So everything, you know, there is a little twist given. And so this twist of truth, torture, shape, becomes also. So what does this touch of the divine do? It straightens it and makes the thing very simple, luminous and clear. And then what happens? Annulled were the tab tables of the law of pain and in their place grew luminous characters. The law of pain is annulled because we discovered that all that we thought as pain was a shattering of our self-imposed limits and we were being liberated but we were crying, hugging those shattered pieces, ah oh, my dear little frame. But the photo was being brought out in bold relief and you know made worldwide. So, uh, it gives us a new vision of life. In place of the law of pain, we believe in the law of pain. But the wisdom that has created this world has made it out of love. It doesn't want to inflict pain, punish us and put us in hell and darkness. No, none of these things. We perceive it as pain because we cling, cling to comfort zones. And there are many, many comfort zones of which we need not speak now. And then you see, once this is clear, then follows these lines. The skillful penman's unseen finger wrote his swift, <coughs> intuitive calligraphy. Savitri is not thought out and analyzed. In fact, for that matter, all of Shirobindu's writings. Swift, intuitive calligraphy. At times, 200 lines at a stretch would flow. Can we imagine what is this? We, we read and you know, people have spent a lifetime trying to remember a few lines of Savitri. Imagine what would be the consciousness of the author who is sitting on a chair and lines after lines are flowing. 200 lines in a row, can we just think about it? The, you know, the only in history of uh, creativity, the one we remember is Vyasa. You know, but for him, we needed a Ganesh to, you know, write because his, his lines were flowing so, so fast. So, lines after lines flowing. And what is contained in that? The Veda of the Earth. Earth's forms were made as divine documents. So, Veda is not just a book, sacred book. Veda is the knowledge which is there in creation. In every element, in every atom, there is the Veda. 
Veda is true knowledge, the wisdom. So, what is there in Savitri? Everything that is there in earth. Every possible forms of knowledge. And I'm telling you, it's no exaggeration. Of course, Mother has spoken about it. Any form of knowledge, its essence is there in Savitri. And through that essence, you can go back to its root and seed and discover it. Earth's forms were made its divine documents. The wisdom embodied mind could not reveal. In conscience, chased from the world's voiceless breast, transfigured were the fixed schemes of reasoning thought. See, the mind cannot reveal the wisdom or the divinity that is hidden in creation. But as this new eye awakens, we see the divine inside. The forms of earth are no more just forms, but they are figures, efforts, attempts to manifest something of the divine. And that's what we see in Savitri, how beautifully day and night has been used as symbol to reveal about creation itself. And all through Savitri we will see this. What is the action of Savitri? Arousing consciousness in things inert. How does it do it? Because it is a capsule of consciousness. You know, some people ask how to read, what to do. Very simple. It's like asking how to touch fire and what will happen when I touch fire. Can there be two answers? <laughs> touch it any which way. You will get burned. That's it. You know, often as doctors we face this. Doctor Saab, this capsule, shall I take this time with this uh, milk or with water, with warm water, with cold water? And then you say, please take it, you know. <laughs> <coughs> it has the active ingredient, it will do its work. <coughs> so when we read Savitri, it arouses consciousness in things in earth. He imposed upon dark atom and dumb mass the diamond script of the imperishable. Another description of Savitri. Diamond script of the imperishable. <coughs> I do not know. I wish and pray and aspire that humanity lives to see the crossover. But one thing is certain. Whether humanity lives or not, Savitri will live. Savitri will remain. And even if everything was destroyed, I'm just taking an extreme scenario. And the first human who got up, you know, we had this movie Planet of the Apes. And when they come out, they discover all kinds of ghastly things, animals and, you know, monkeys. But if I, I imagine another more bright scenario, that the humans who survive just find Savitri, I can tell you they will build up everything. And you know they are sending all kinds of things in space capsule. I wish somebody has the bright idea and <laughs> send Savitri in a digitalized form. It is enough to rescue a civilization. Inscribed on the dim heart of fallen things. A pain song of the free infinite. Inscribed. Where is Savitri written? As we read it, it gets inscribed on our hearts, on our minds, on our very body cells. And the name, foundation of eternity. Each line of it has the same vibration as the original word, the name, the power, foundation of eternity and traced on the awake exultant cells in the ideographs of the ineffable, the lyric of the love that waits through time. Don't we know it's a story of love, the love of Satyavan and Savitri. But what kind of love? Not what we call love today. That today we love. 
Tomorrow we are together, on the third day we are bye-bye. So, you know, <laughs> between the high and the bye, there is love. But there is a love which goes beyond the burning of the body. It's a love that waits through time. Only the divine can love us this way. And we can love only if we are blessed by the divine grace. Some touch of that love can awaken in us. So it's the story of love. But what is that love? The love that waits through time. And the mystic volume of the book of bliss. What is the book of bliss? Creation itself is the book of bliss. But there is a mystic side to it. It is a divine document, we are being told. Creation is a divine document. But there is a side which is hidden, it's mystic. So Savitri reveals that hidden side of creation. Mystic volume of the book of bliss and the message of the superconscient fire. What does the divine want us to know? What does he want us to do? How does he want us to see ourselves, our relation with the world? and our relation with the Divine, all this is revealed and much more in Savitri. So we will stop here and continue tomorrow. I don't know if somebody has a quick question, I am fine with it. Okay, so we will meet tomorrow morning.